Thanks very much. So yeah, today I'm gonna to be talking about um, the de-differentiation derived neurostem cells, which is a project from my PhD. So many brain cancers can arise from the overproliferation of stem cells. And these um, stem cell populations stop obeying um, all these different signals and they start to mass proliferate and that's how we can get um, tumor formation. So interestingly, the activation of proliferation also occurs in a similar way during regeneration. And so upon tissue loss or, in or injury, regeneration is the activation of proliferation in a controlled manner that can then restore the tissue loss. So even though these processes seem quite different, they're also very similar in many ways. And we can learn a lot about each of them from one another. So one of the main things that they have in common is the process of de-differentiation. So de-differentiation of neurons occurs when they lose their mature identity and adopt stem properties, stem-like properties, and they can um, then form ectopic stem cells. So today I want to talk to you about one of my projects, which is how characterizing ectopic stem cells that are induced by de-induced by de-differentiation can teach us many things. Firstly, it can inform us how cancer stem cells may arise, but also why they're not obeying different signals to differentiate and why they have unlimited, unlimited um, proliferative potential. On the flip side, de-differentiation can also be a source of new neurons for regeneration. So we also need to know how faithful this process is from ectopic stem cells and whether we would get a successful regeneration or a more tumorogenesis kind of um, phenotype. So I've addressed uh, three main criteria in order to characterize these ectopic stem cells. And they are whether they can obey termination cues, whether they create the correct types of progeny and also the correct numbers of progeny. So in order to study de-differentiation, I've utilized the Drosophila medulla as a model. So the medulla is the visual processing system of the fly, and here we have a larval fly brain, and the medulla is this region here in pink, and it's located within the optic lobes. So on the outside of the medulla, we have the, the neural stem cells, and they, these are indicated here in pink, and they're on what's called the superficial layer of the medulla. So if we imagine the optic lobe kind of like a ball, then the medulla neurostem cells wrap around the outside of the optic lobe like a band. So if you can imagine, as these new as these neurostem cells are creating new neurons, the older neurons are moving deep and, and deeper into the medulla. So if we take a section down the medulla, then we would expect to only see the neurons. And so this is a really good system to, in order to study neurogenesis and de-differentiation, because we can always see the wild type stem cells on the superficial layer or the outside, and the neurons in the deep sections in the middle. So in order to study de-differentiation, we look in the deep layers or the, the, or the neuronal layers, which are marked here in green, and then we stain for stem cell markers. So you can see in a normal wild type um, medulla, there are no stem cells within the neuron layer. However, upon de-differentiation, then what we see is um, these um, ectopic stem cells within the neuronal layer suggesting that de-differentiation is occurring. So the first thing that I wanted to do was conduct a genetic screen in order to discover new novel regulators of de-differentiation. And so I did this by either overexpressing or knocking down genes that were expressed in the um, neurostem cells or in the neurons and looking whether these, this misexpression would induce de-differentiation of the medulla neurons. I had five hits on my screen and these are the fly genes. They are ELIV, SOX, Neuro, Prospera, Asens, and Deadpan. And they all had human orthologs written below. And the gene that I'm going to be talking mostly about today is Deadpan. And the orthologue of Deadpan in humans is HES1. And HES1 has also been implicated in many different human cancers. So within the screen, what we found was when we overexpressed Deadpan, then we got um, the induction of ectopic stem cells via de differentiation. And so this is what the screen looks like here. Outlined are what we call clones. So that's the patches of cells that are overexpressing deadpan. And you can see in this deep layer of the medulla neurons, we're getting heaps and heaps of these ectopic stem cells that are being induced. So with these ectopic stem cells, I then want to start to answer these questions that I um, mentioned previously. So the first thing that I wanted to understand is whether they could obey termination cues. To do this, I looked, um, I compared these to those superficial wild type neurostem cells that are on the um, 
the superficial layer of the medulla. And I looked at a time when these um, wild type neurostem cells usually terminate. And I wanted to see whether we would still have the presence of these ectopic neurostem cells. So what I found at a time when all of the wild type neurostem cells was gone is that we still had the presence of these ectopic neurostem cells. And this was significantly increased compared to the control. So this suggests that these ectopic stem cells aren't obeying termination cues. And this could also be a reason why um, some ectopic stem cells are then able to go on and form tumors because they're not able to terminate. But then I wanted to understand why they aren't terminating like normal neurostem cells. So a major regulator of um, termination is temporal regulation. And so this refers to many different stem cell types. When, when a stem cell is born, they will transit through and express different transcription factors up until the last transcription factor, and then they will terminate. And in the medulla, it looks a little bit like this. We have, when the neurostem cells are first born, when they express one factor, they will then turn that on, so sorry, turn that off and express another factor. And as time goes on, then you can start to see this really nice temporal layout of the neurostem cells. So here in green, we'll see the oldest neurostem cells, and here in pink, we see the youngest neurostem cells. So in the medulla, the temporal factors that are expressed are homothorax, which is the pink one. It's, the, it's an early factor, so it's expressed in the early um, neurostem cells. We have mid factors like eyeless, sulfur paired, and dikeet. And then we have late factors such as talus there in green. So what happens in the medulla neurostem cells is that they will transit through all of these different factors, and then after the last factor, they'll go on to terminate. So what I wanted to do was to see whether these ectopic stem cells express any of these um, any of these temporal transcription factors, because that might tell us a bit more about why they're not terminating. So for today, I've just picked a few different key factors to show you. So at the um, start, we looked at homothorax, which as I mentioned, is an early factor. And you can see these ectopic stem cells here in pink. But when we look at homothorax expression, then it's obvious that they weren't expressing the early factor homothorax. Next, we look at the mid-temporal factor sulfur paired, and you can see there's lots of sulfur paired expression in these ectopic stem cells. And lastly, we looked at talus, which is the last temporal factor, and you can see that there is a massive reduction in the talus expression, or well, uh, that it's not expressed really. And so when we compared this to the normal wild type neurostem cells, we found that compared to the amount of homothorax and talus, so the first and last factors that, that um, would normally be expressed, there, this was significantly reduced in the ectopic stem cells. Additionally, we found compared to the wild type neurostem cells that there was a significant increase in the amount of the mid-temporal factors eyeless and sulfur paired. So this suggests that these ectopic stem cells are expressing mid-temporal factors like sulfur paired, and they're not expressing uh, the first and last temporal factors such as hemothorax and talus. We then further investigated this and looked at a really young stage of the ectopic stem cells that was equivalent to when wild type neurostem cells are usually expressing homothorax. But what we found was that these um, early ectopic stem cells never expressed homothorax and actually they immediately um, expressed sloppy paired. Additionally, we did the um, reverse experiment and we looked when these, ex when these ectopic stem cells were a lot older, when a wild type stem cell would usually be expressing talus. And we found that they weren't expressing talus at this time, but they were still expressing sloppy paired. So together, this suggests that these ectopic stem cells are immediately um, induced into a mid-temporal window, and they're actually stuck in the temporal series. They're not able to progress through to the end. So when we wanted to ask whether um, they were obeying termination cues, and the answer was no, we found out that this was because they were stuck in the mid-temporal window. We then wanted to see whether this would have any effect on the type of progeny that was produced by these ectopic stem cells. So aside from regulating termination, the temporal series also regulates the kind of progeny that are produced by neurostem cells. So what happens is upon the expression of each different temporal transcription factor, that they create a specific kind of progeny. For example, a homothorax um, positive neurostem cell will only create a certain kind of um, progeny from the homothorax window. So what we wanted to do then was to look at progeny from different um, from different temporal windows to see what kind of 
progeny there's ectopic stem cells are creating. So we looked at toy, which labels progeny from the sloppy paired mid temporal window. And we also looked at Talus and Rico, which label progeny from later temporal windows. When we compared this to the progeny that were being um, created from the normal neurostem cells, what we found is that these ectopic neurostem cells created an increase of toy positive progeny and a decrease in of the talus and repo, so the later positive, so the later born progeny. So together this suggests that these ectopic stem cells are creating an excess of progeny from this mid temporal window at the expense of the later born progeny. So again, this was because they were stuck in this mid temporal window. And lastly, we wanted to see whether uh, these ectopic stem cells created the correct number of progeny. To do this, we did an uh, EDU pulse chase assay in order to compare the amount of progeny created from these wild type neural stem cells compared to these ectopic neural stem cells. And what we found when we looked at the wild type is that we had heaps of these progeny in here in gray. However, there was a significant reduction um, of the amount of progeny created by these ectopic stem cells compared to these wild type neural stem cells. So this suggests that they also have a reduced cell cycle speed as well. So now that we understood a bit more about the phenotypes of these ectopic stem cells, we really wanted to delve deeper into why they could um, be possessing these. And so to do that, we collaborated with Owen Marshall in order to do some dam ID. And so this was to identify the targets of deadpan. So what we did is we looked at the targets of deadpan in neurostem cells in the medulla compared to neurostem cells in the rest of the larval brain. And so what we found was that deadpan bound in proximity to all of the temporal transcription factors, but within the medulla, this was significantly reduced in the homothorax and talus um, areas and significantly increased in the ilus and sloppy pair. So this suggests that the mid-temporal factors are direct target genes of deadpan. And so that could be why we're getting this immediate induction into the temporal window upon deadpan overexpression. Additionally, we found that the cell cycle genes were also direct targets of deadpan, and that might be why we're getting, um, so deadpan may be repressing the cell, the cell cycle genes, which is why we're getting a slower um, cycling. So we next wanted to, un oh, sorry, someone's, <laughs> thank you. Sorry, someone just came to my door to drop off the delivery. Um, so what we know now is that um, these ectopic stem cells are stuck in the mid-temporal window and um, they're creating these, um, creating an excess of the mid-temporal progeny at expense um, of the later and so on. So then we wanted to understand if we can fix this phenotype, if, we can, if there's a way to reverse this phenotype. So within the wild type stem cells, the, um, the temporal transcription factors are known to not only activate each other in order for the expression of the next one to occur, but they're also able to repress each other. So it's well known that dikeet, the factor after the, um, the factor after sloppy paired, is able to actually repress sloppy paired. So we wanted to see whether this was true in the ectopic neurostem cells. So I looked at both sloppy pan and dikeet, and what I found was that cells that express dikeet didn't express sloppy pan. So this shows that sloppy pan and dikeet are still able to abut each other's expression within the ectopic stem cells. But obviously we're getting a lot of sloppy pan, so this might not be enough for the triggering of the temporal series. But what would happen if we increase the amount of dikeet that was being expressed? Would that be sufficient to repress sloppy pan? So we, what we did was we overexpressed dikeet in these ectopic stem cells. And so a reminder, when we look at the normal ectopic stem cells that were induced by a deadpan overexpression, you can see the abundance of sloppy pad that's really being um, created here. However, when we overexpress dikeet within these ectopic stem cells, we see a reduction in the amount of sloppy pad. And that's really um, obvious here in this graph as well, the significant decrease in the amount of sloppy pad. But even more interestingly, we're getting this significant increase in the amount of talus, the last temporal factor that's um, being expressed in these, in these stem cells. So together, this is suggesting that dikeet over expression is sufficient to trigger the progression 
of the temporal series. We then wanted to see whether this was also sufficient to create the correct kinds of progeny. And so to do this, we looked at these progeny markers again, toy to mark the mid-temporal um, window and then tails and repo in these later temporal windows. And what we found was that compared to the ectopic stem cells, the um, ectopic stem cells that overexpress that heat had a downward trend in the amount of toy that was being produced. And this was not significant, but that's probably expected because dikeet is also, also creates toy positive progeny. But more interestingly, when we looked at these later born progeny types like Tails and Reaper, we found a significant increase in the amount of um, these progeny that were being created when we overexpressed dikeet. So together this shows us that dikeet is not only sufficient to trigger uh, the temporal series progression, but also to promote the the appropriate production of neuronal subtypes. So what I've shown you is that dikeet overexpression was sufficient to progress the temporal series and to create appropriate um, progeny types. But next we wanted to see whether it then allowed the ectopic stem cells to obey termination cues. So to do this, we looked at a termination time of the ectopic stem cells and compared this to the US dikeet overexpressing um, stem cells. What we found was there was a significant reduction in the presence of um, ecto ectopic neuro stem cells, which suggests that dikeet overexpression is also sufficient to promote the termination of these ectopic stem cells. So now they're able to obey these appropriate termination cues. Lastly, we looked at whether they were able to create our uh, correct progeny, progeny numbers. And interestingly, they still weren't able to. So this shows that um, these two pathways are probably more in parallel rather than connected. We then wanted to see whether promoting the cell cycle could affect any of these phenotypes as well. And what we found when we overexpressed certain members of the cell cycle was that it also allowed these ectopic stem cells to progress through the temporal series. And they were also able to create the correct progeny numbers as well as terminate on time. So now we understand this mechanism in the ectopic stem cells that are induced by deadpan overexpression. But we also wanted to see whether this held true for other models, other tumor models that were induced by the differentiation. So in order to look at this, we looked at two other um, the differentiation models, and they are the hyperactivation of notch and also the loss of function of Lola. So what we found when we looked um, in the at the mid at the temporal identity was that they're actually both stuck in the mid-temporal window as well. We found that neither of them were able to obey the correct termination signals. And lastly, they weren't able to create the correct kinds of progeny. They were also biased to creating mid-temporal progeny. We overexpressed dikeet and we found that um, in these ectopic stem cells, it was sufficient to progress the mid-temporal to progress the temporal series, so they were no longer stuck in the mid-temporal window. They now obeyed termination cues as well, and they created um, later-born progeny. So to summarize, what I found was that these ectopic neuro stem cells did not obey termination cues. They didn't correct, sorry, they didn't create the appropriate progeny types or the, or the appropriate progeny numbers. This was mainly because they were stuck in this mid-temporal window. And they were stuck in this mid-temporal window because the mid-temporal transcription factors and the cell cycle genes were direct targets of deadpan. However, we were able to overcome this through, through overexpressing dikeet as well as promoting the cell cycle. And lastly, we um, found that this temporal progression was disrupted in other models of de-differentiation as well, showing a higher implication of this mechanism. So just to conclude, the main statement that I want you to take away from this is that temporal identity is an important regulator of ectopic neuro stem cells. And because um, the inability to terminate is such a key characteristic of cancer neuro stem cells, 
it becomes really important to think about um, how we can incorporate adjusting their temporal identity in order to correct this inability to, to terminate within Cantor neuro stem cells. And secondly, we know that ectopic neuro stem cells have to obey signals for the um, for appropriate generation of new neurons. And so this is really important when we go to think about regeneration or using, for example, like induced pluripotent stem cells in order to create correct neurons, they have to be creating the correct, sorry, they have to be obeying the correct signals in order for that to be worth anything. Otherwise we're gonna get um, just the wrong kinds of neurons being created. And so with that, I would like to thank both of my labs, um, Louise's lab at Peter Mac and also Patricia's lab at Melbourne Uni and all of the core facilities and so on. Thank you.